so my name is Ola Olsson and um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Queensland now, um, working with stuff totally unrelated uh, to what I'm going to be talking about today. So what I'm talking about today is mostly to do with what I did as a PhD student, um, which then in turn relates to my past as a uh, graphics um, and game developer. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, in my present position as a postdoc, um, I will be interested in uh, supervising uh, thesis projects, things like that. So, if anyone knows people at UQ or other, I don't know how it works here, who is uh, interested in uh, GPU programming or graphics, then let them know I'm, I exist because I don't have any lectures, so I have a little bit of a problem uh, finding students at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm also here to represent myself, and so of course I'm starting up a, a consultancy business. We'll see how that goes, of course, but um, yeah, helping out with um, real-time graphics and parallel uh, GPU programming for anyone who's interested to keep that thing happening. And <clears throat> then after all that, I'll introduce the talk. and. Um, it's about managing uh, many lights in real time with clustered shading. And the question, of course, is why with clustered shading? And the answer is because I came up with it, so I like it. So that's the real reason, but I'll try to get you on board as well. Um, <clears throat> so it's a um, very flexible um, and high efficiency uh, algorithm, the, the best out there, I would like to say. Let's just, you know, it's pretty good. I hope you'll be convinced by the end of the talk. Um, it's very flexible, it's, very, it's orthogonal in the sense that it's fairly easy to integrate into existing game engines. Uh, over the past few weeks I've actually spent some time um, making it work in uh, the Unreal Engine because it's an interesting uh, technology demo for me. Um, <coughs> without too much work. Uh, and this has been validated in the industry, so we have two shipped games using clustered shading. And uh, Outlast 2 is coming out later this year, and I was contacted a few weeks ago by one of the uh, programmers who wanted to see how we were going and said that they were using it. Um, Intel and AMD have done presentations and demos of the technique as well, promoting it at various events like um, GDC. Um, <clears throat> and as we show in our SIGGRAPH course, which I recommend you look if you want to know more about this, there is more material in the notes and slides from our SIGGRAPH course. Uh, it can be implemented on mobile uh, as well as um, discrete graphics processors. So that's about why we want to talk about it for hours. So the first, so this is, comes in two sections, this um, presentation, or two talks really. And the first one is um, the long prehistory of uh, efficient shading with many lights leading all the way up to and spending most of the time on clustered shading. And then in the second part, which actually I should have said when I was on this slide, uh, we'll add shadows to this mix, which is something that hadn't really been done too much before. Okay, so let's try to outline the first talk. Uh, first, I'll try to define a bit more about what we're talking, because it's, many lights can mean a lot of different things. Then I'll go over ancient shading techniques, which is from the really, really distant computer graphics, real-time real computer graphics past. Um, and then I'll go into modern techniques, which are not quite as old. And <clears throat> yeah, I had to separate them somehow, right? Uh, so don't read too much into it. First, since you have no idea why we're going to want this many lights, uh, I'll try to motivate that as well, and uh, with a few images. So this is from Need for Speed the Run, which is getting on in the years already, uh, and they had about 2,600 lights in a scene, and they use it to make this fairly nice-looking nighttime look in their uh, in their uh, levels. If you have Ridiculous number of lights, you can also use them to um, visualize uh, global illumination techniques, like they do with photon splatting here, which is similar. And if you are doing just cause 3, you need lots of lights because you have cities full of them in the background. So, problem definition as promised. 
um, <coughs> real-time algorithms, so this is not offline rendering, and we're talking about the order of thousands of lights. So not really millions of lights or hundreds of thousands of lights, because then you would probably start to want to use approximation techniques, and that's not at all the topic for this talk. Um, we talk about non-physical limited range lights, you know, the kind of lights where once the photon reaches X meters, it falls down. This is perfectly normal in games, so we've got to do that for performance reasons. And we're also assuming that everything is dynamic, so lights and uh, every part of the scene can move freely every frame. There's no pre-computation. All right. Then we're also going to not be talking about shading. So all of the techniques I'm going to talk about is called, called deferred shading, forward shading, clustered shading, tile shading. I'm not going to talk about shading at all. Shading is what happens once you have a light source and you want to compute the reflectance from a particular point, right? That's shading. We're going to talk about what happens uh, in the system to give you the light source so you can compute the shading. So that's what I call light assignment, but it's also called light culling. And this is an interesting problem because if you're going to be stupid about it and you have two million pixels and two or a thousand lights, then you're going to run that in the brute force way. It's just going to not be very elegant, right? So let's not do that. With that said, we're going to move into traditional forward shading. <coughs> um, and the reason I label it traditional is because this is how things were from the beginning of GPUs up until Recently, or if you're on the mobile side of things, it's probably still the main uh, technique. But since GPUs are a lot more flexible, some of the things that applied and that I'm going to highlight here don't we have sort of become a bit more blurred nowadays. So it's a sort of historical take on this. Um, <clears throat> but this is basically what GPUs were built to do. So it's the traditional approach, and, it, and you run all your geometry through uh, the pipeline in a single pass, and this um, computes your final image. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so um, you send, submit your geometry, you rasterize your triangles, this generates fragments, which are interpolated properties from your triangles and depth, and this is then fed into a shader. You can do vertex shading as well, but this is just an optimization. Um, <clears throat> at which point you need to get information about lights so you can compute the final shading. And then the color, resulting color is merged into the frame buffer. So that's forward shading. And the crux is to uh, work out which lights you're going to use with every bit of geometry. And um, Basically, what you have to do is you have to round um, all of the lights up before each draw call. All right? So we want the minimal sets of lights, because otherwise we'll be doing too much work. Uh, so we want small geometry batches, so we don't overlap too many lights. On the other hand, we want quick drawing, so we want large batches of triangles to keep the GPU happy and not switch materials too often. So we have a problem, right? You can't do both at the same time. Um, so the best you can do in this situation is some kind of compromise, and there's lots of those. And to look at this in, in more colorful detail, um, you can have the situation where you have a few large objects in your scene, and many small lights, and that leads to a lot of redundant um, shading work. So when you're shading one point part of that thing, you have to consider all the lights, because you had to round them up for the object in, before you started the draw call. Or you can have lots of um, small objects and a few large lights, in which case you will individually work out that each of these are affected by the same light. So you do a lot of redundant work on that end. And of course, there's no problem having both bunnies and houses in the same scene. So you run into um, a fairly difficult uh, balancing act. And <clears throat> you know this um, large object can be just a single large triangle in your scene. So it's not like you can subdivide necessarily either to solve it. Um, so that's the summary of traditional forward shading. And um, the good things, there are a few of those. It's a single pass technique. So uh, there's little overhead because you don't have to store the frame buffer. You don't have to run through the geometry more than once. Uh, transparency works as well as it works when you're rasterizing. 
And because, I mean, we're feeding the hardware the way it was designed, multi-sample anti-aliasing just works out of the box. And if you don't have a lot of lights, then this is great, but this is not the point of this talk. This is, this, we're talking about when we have a lot of lights. Um, so the bad things, um, overdraw. We draw a triangle over something we've already computed lots of expensive shading for. We've wasted a lot of work. And the problem of batching being coupled with uh, the light assignment. Um, so moving to a slightly more modern uh, GPU, uh, we're getting to the territory of traditional deferred shading, uh, which pretty much sort of had the goals of solving these two problems together. So we're decoupling shading from geometric complexity of the scene, and we also want to solve the overdraw problem and only compute shading once for each visible sample. <clears throat> and um, this was introduced in the 90s, um, but only sort of got traction in the games industry once multiple render targets was introduced around the mid-2000s. But uh, a lot of the high-end game engines have never looked back, you could say. So it's got to have something going for it. And uh, so the key idea is, to everyone's great surprise, to defer shading when you're doing deferred shading. And this means that you, I won't go on, I could do that for a long time. Um, <clears throat> instead of, or so in the same way as with traditional forward shading, you do a, a geometry pass, interpolate your attributes, you get your fragments, but instead of feeding them to a shader, uh, you just store them in uh, G buffers. So basically a buffer per attribute. And, and, and pixel. So um, <clears throat> then after you've done all of your geometry to the buffers, you do a shading pass, uh, which is then completely separate from the geometry pass. So they have no, no relation at all, uh, except the buffers. Um, in which case uh, you load the, for each pixel the G buffer data, you compute the shading, and here's where you need your lights, and then you accumulate um, the frame buffer, sorry, that was already there. And since this is done um, as a single pass after uh, your geometry pass, it's done when your depth complexity is already resolved. You're only shading the nearest samples. So gone is the um, overdraw problem. All right, so G buffers might look a bit like this. We have color, the reflectance, diffuse reflectance, specular reflectance, a normal, and a position encoded as a depth. Um, and then it works something like this. So there you might be able to make out the blue patch on the ground, that's a light. And for each light, in turn, we draw uh, the bounding geometry as triangles. And for each of these uh, fragments that are covered by this, these triangles, you read the G buffers, compute the shading for this light, and write out the final uh, color to the frame buffer. Um, <clears throat> so you blend it in. And just to point out here that um, if anyone has questions along the way, I'm very happy to you interrupt me rather than save it all up to the end where we might have forgotten where we started. So that's much better. Um, and then you just do this each for each light. And since you do all the lights um, one at a time or however the hardware chooses to render things, it, they are totally independent and you accumulate the final image in something like this. Um, the scenario is the, the you're just adding to the final frame buffer, the color buffer, which typically contains the uh, sort of ambient color from the, begin, from the uh, geometry pass. So you read the G buffer, but you accumulate or blend, uh, ad additive blend into the frame buffer. Um, yeah, so there are other variants on this theme, which I have pointed out sometimes uh, to me when I get this far, and they're called deferred lighting and late pre-pass. Um, they are basically the same, but you factor the lighting equations, which means you can do a little bit skinnier uh, G buffers and things like that. And they used to be popular, but these days, because they do restrict the um, shading model uh, even further, uh, they're not I don't think anyone uses them anymore, basically, for high-end games engines. Um, 
So the good thing is light management is trivial. You just throw the geometry of the light on the um, rasterizer and it just happens. You don't even have to think about it. Um, <clears throat> you don't have any overdraw because we took care of that in the separated geometry pass. Um, the bad things, there are several, but the one I'm, I will be talking about is the very high bandwidth usage. And because <clears throat> this is an interesting problem, we'll sort of um, build up to the sort of punchline for that one. So that brings us to the second part, or whatever I call it, the part of the part, um, the modern shading techniques. And we'll see how that's sort of separated from the uh, non-modern ones. Here is the starting point. So this graph is a logarithmic plot, or exponential, whichever you call it, whichever way around. <coughs> So things are growing exponentially if it's linear, uh, of GPU compute power and uh, memory bandwidth. And this plotted over 10 years. And we can see a fairly clearly exponential trend for both over this period. It's not exact, but it's pretty good. And we can also see uh, that there is a fairly clear um, difference in the exponent for memory bandwidth and um, the um, compute power. And so over over 10 years, this amounts to a factor of 10, by coincidence, obviously, um, in uh, performance. So if you started out with a bandwidth-bound algorithm uh, 10 years ago, it would have got 10 times faster by now. If you started out with a compute-bound, it gets 100 times faster. So that's a pretty big difference and tells us about what we should aim for when future-proofing our, our, our algorithms. Um, <clears throat> so. Just to make it clear, I mean, when you have two exponentials and they have different exponents, the gap is also growing exponentially. So this, and it's not showing any signs of, of uh, changing in the foreseeable future, this trend. Despite uh, what this guy uh, has tried to tell everyone for the last few years, I don't know if you've been listening to him. It's the CEO of NVIDIA. He says things like this. Anyway, we'll just look at the next slide and, and and see what, what happened, because they've actually announced their specifications for their Pascal-based uh, GTX, uh, what's it called? 1080. 1080, yeah. A mouthful, that one. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like this. It's actually a memory bandwidth is flat. It actually is sloping slightly down for the flagship GPUs. So that's kind of, oh, well, hap, that, there goes that one. But probably they'll bring out high bit bandwidth memory next year for consumers, maybe or maybe even the year after. It depends on how, how expensive it is simply. But yeah, it's not that's happening that fast. So that gap is growing healthily still, not catching up. I was actually told this by an NVIDIA engineer at one point in a project for high performance computing, but, they, but we're going to close this gap. And I was like, no, but there's a physical reality underneath where wires go around chips. It's expensive. <laughs> you cannot promise this thing. <laughs> so they. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a sort of a fundamental uh, limit of designing things with little wires. The longer they are, the higher the cost of signaling. So you can't build, you can't signal over long distances. So you have to build deeper and deeper cache hierarchies to make it work, and things like that. So yeah, it's not going to go away. It's just more of a question of how how fast are they going to diverge. All right. So that brings us to um, the modern part um, with this in mind, and so we have already observed that compute grows much faster than bandwidth, and also GPUs have become uh, extremely flexible in that, I mean, we have CUDA, soon we will have uh, what is called uh, C++17 is around the corner, which will bring parallelism for GPUs to mainstream programming, which will be exciting a year or two away. This might even start happening for real. Um, <clears throat> and this brings me to sort of Probably, if you're going to take something away from this talk about uh, graphics programming, it is that um, we should explore alternatives to rasterization for graphics. So if you look in the past, um, the only way to get something to perform in real time was to draw triangles. This, GPUs could draw triangles fast, but pretty much nothing else. So some amazingly clever work has gone into making uh, things, compute things, by drawing triangles. I mean, I'm just glad I didn't have to do all that. Um, <clears throat> these days, you have uh, fully programmable um, random access to memory, everything like that. 
uh, you should think about what it is you're trying to compute. And this would allow us to revisit a lot of older algorithms and make better ones that directly compute the end result. And that's pretty much what the modern shading techniques are about, from my point of view anyway. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when we switched to defer shading, we introduced a new type of overdraw. We sold the geometry overdraw, but instead we introduced light overdraw. So that means that if you have a number of lights affecting the same pixel, you will need to read the G buffer every time. And if you remember how the last image looked, so that's um, the light volumes just drawn additively on top of each other to show the density. It can get pretty, pretty uh, hairy. And I just told you that reading and writing memory could be a bad thing, so yeah. So looking at it schematically, it looks like this. This is the inner loop of a deferred shading implementation. So we loop over the lights, and by drawing, we loop over all the pixels that the light covers. And then we read the G buffer, compute the shading, and write out to the frame buffer. So we get repeated read and writes in the inner loop. Um, which, and unless we have a phenomenally expensive shading function, this will be bandwidth bound by definition. It's sort of impossible for it not to be. Um, <clears throat> so we would like to uh, rewrite this loop, right? We want to hoist the read out of the loop and instead for each, um, just read that once, run the inner loop over all the lights instead. So we just swap the, the loop iterations and then finally write once uh, the final shading, which basically just solves the bandwidth problem. That's, there's nothing more to it really. The only slight issue is, of course, that we suddenly now need sequential access, access to all the lights inside the shader. Which, you know, we've got to solve, and that's what these techniques are all about. So, on one end of the spectrum, we could just have a global list. Um, I already hinted about how efficient that would be. So you just have one list of all your lights and every shade and pixel you loop through them. Uh, that's not cool. And you could go the other way and have um, one list per pixel all the way over here. And uh, Damien, who's not here today, he's here sometimes, uh, invented this idea in uh, 2007. So first of everyone. Uh, unfortunately, it <coughs> doesn't work um, for the same reasons that bandwidth, being bandwidth bound is bad in the first place. You have to construct one list per pixel, which is on the order of the same amount of work as just computing the shading in the first place. So, and then you have to store all this data somewhere. So uh, we've got to do something, something in between. And um, instead we store lists of lights for groups of similar pixels. And the difference between tiled and clustered shading is basically in, contained in the similarity, what we used to say, how we create our groups of pixels. And then <coughs> uh, we get a nice coherency between samples and so nearby pixels will have the same list, so they read and uh, access the same uh, memory and uh, compute the same shading function at the same time. This is good. And uh, not very much overhead. But we need to construct the lists in a conservative way so that they loop through uh, a list containing all the lights that might possibly affect any of the pixels in the group. But that's okay, because what we're wasting there is computational power. And wasting a little bit of compute to save a lot of bandwidth is going to win in the long run. It's probably going to win straight away, actually. All right, <clears throat> so here's a summary of uh, the generalized modern deferred shading algorithm. You render the G buffers, as before, for standard deferred shading. You do what I call the light assignment, where you work out an acceleration structure to look up your lists of lights. And this is typically a grid, because anything more complex probably takes more time than you win building it um, and accessing it. And then you do a full screen pass. And in the full screen pass, you read the G-buffer data, and then you just look up the list of, correct list of lights and loop over them and write out the shading, just like I showed. With a minor modification, we can also support forward shading. <coughs> um, you do the same things. You can do a pre-pass pre uh, to get the depth buffer to work with if you want to, but this is not mandatory. 
Uh, otherwise, it's very similar, except you compute the shading not in a full screen pass, but in your normal um, geometry pass. Uh, obviously, in this case, you get back the old overdraw problem again. So whether or not you want to do this is another issue. Um, so the good things about the modern shading techniques, in summary, uh, is that they solved the bandwidth problem because they were designed to solve it. Well, I'm not sure that people, when they invented tile shading, actually uh, set out to solve the bandwidth problem. Um, but that's what they did. I think they just said, hey, look, this is cool. We've got this compute shader thing. Let's, let's do stuff with it. Um, and this was supposed to be Johan Andersson of DICE, by the way. He was first, I think, with that thing. Very flexible. Uh, you can do deferred or forward. They're pretty much the same, so it's quite easy to switch. Or you can do both, which is probably more common. And since we can have forward um, shading supported, we can get transparency back. And I don't know if anyone noticed, but high-end game engines, they don't, they don't do that much transparent stuff, right? Maybe it's coming back a bit now, but uh, for a decade or so, there was nothing transparent in a high-end game because you can't with deferred shading. It's, it's just too much work. You've got to maintain the, like two separate different stacks of uh, shaders. Not anymore. <clears throat> the bad things uh, is that you get a um, slightly more complex light shader um, because you've got to support all the different light types in the same shader because they are now in the inner loop. Um, although if this is really a problem, you can work around this um, with a bit of thought. And you don't get any shadow map reuse. And this is the first time I mentioned this, I realize. So it doesn't make sense. I should have talked about this earlier as well. We'll just skip that and come back to that in the second talk. OK, now I'll talk about the specifics of tile shading. And then we'll get to cluster shading last, but not least. Um, <clears throat> so tile shading uh, covers tile deferred shading, tile forward shading, and AMD really did feel that they had to rebrand tile forward shading and call it forward plus. You will have to ask them why this was necessary, but I suspect the marketing department will be involved. Um, but anyway, don't. Sorry, AMD. AMD. Yes. But I was first naming it tile forward shading. Anyway. Uh, but don't use it. Don't use the term. Use tile forward shading because it does tell you what it does, right? Forward plus doesn't. And there's a lot of confusion out there, I can tell you, about that just originates from this. But is what's clustered forward shading is forward plus plus. I mean, forward hash. I mean, what am I? Anyway, it's just stupid. <coughs> it's a useless term, simply. And there is a perfectly good one. Yeah. Now I'll contain myself. Ah, no. <laughs> All right, so here's an example scene. I've, um, I've shown this so many times now, so I'll, but I really try to tell you what, I'm, what we're looking at. I keep updating my slides, but I never got to go over these guys again because it takes so much time. Um, so it's a Crytek sponsor scene. Everyone has seen that. I've popped the top, fo top off and put in six colorful lights and a tree. Important. And um, <clears throat> we have the camera over there looking through the tree as if by coincidence towards the lion head on the wall. <coughs> that's Maya's rendering. It's not my fault that things pop out. So it looks like that. So you're looking straight through the, uh, the light volumes. All right, so um, to construct um, our acceleration structure, which is a 2D grid for tile shading, uh, we can do something like this. And again, I want to point out um, a sort of the usual way people seem to go about this, and I discovered recently uh, the Unreal Engine also goes about this, is by uh, treating every tile as an individual frustum and letting them just brute force all the lights. In general, this is a bad idea because they will be, all of them share, all the neighbors share the same planes. You're computing the same plane. I mean, if you scale it up, more lights and more uh, finer grid resolution, it, it's just an enormous waste of computation. So I don't know why people persist in doing it that way, but um, there it is. This way, I feel, is a little bit more sane. So you work out the screen space bounding box of your um, light, which incidentally, Unreal Engine already has code that does. They just ignore it. And then you just add the light to said tiles. This is pretty simple. 
you do the same for the next light and keep going. So I'm just showing the cans. <coughs> then um, once when you add the lights, you also need to do what's called the depth range optimization. And it sounds like it's an optimization you might do, but it's pretty much necessary to get performance in the case of tile shading. And um, here I'm trying to show you the, um, the view first. I'm sliced vertically, right? And we have these tiles then in from top to bottom. And the red squiggly stuff is uh, geometry in our depth buffer. And so you compute a minimax depth for each of the tiles. And then when you add the lights, you test these bounds. And the yellow light, or if it's green, it's out of range of all the tiles. It's overlapping, so you can discard it. Same with the yellow one. It's in front of everything. Pink one is a bit more interesting and um, because it potentially should be added to these three tiles. But it only doesn't overlap the depth range of this one, so it only gets added to two. And without this range, uh, depth range optimization, if you have lots of lights in your viewing volume, they all get added and you have to compute uh, a lot of expensive unnecessary shading, or at least testing. And at the end, you get an uh, acceleration structure like this, which is just a grid where you can look up um, your light list. And inherited from the modern approach, we have low bandwidth. Um, light assignment is very simple, it's just 2D. So it's not much work to uh, code that up. And it's pretty fast. And the main problem is that we have um, a strong view dependence because it is a 2D structure that we are trying to fit onto a 3D scene. Um, <clears throat> and what's primarily a problem is depth discontinuities where the tiles get very long. So we'll look at this in an animation. So there is a test scene, it's a road. Roads exist in games. They have light posts. They exist too. Um, these are the bounding uh, spheres of the lights. So you see the influence. And continuing on, this is the final shaded scene. It's a masterpiece of visual quality. All right, so tiles, they look like this. <clears throat> and you can clearly see the tiles stretching from the light posts all the way to the box that surrounds the scene. So it gets very long, and if there are any lights along that volume, they all have to be added, but they only affect something at the front and something at the back, and all the others in the middle are just wasted storage and wasted computation looping through. Um, <clears throat> so that's bad, but let's look at this tile here, which is flat, it's just ground, right? So that should be a good tile. There's no discontinuities in there. Great. Well, um, if we look at that from the 3D view again, it turns out to be really long and flat ground, I'm sure. We have them in games, right? There's, there's got to be a problem. And so, yeah, as you can see, that tile cuts through all the lights in the scene. Um, so this happens. And therefore, people have proposed a, a few extensions to tile shading to try to sort of get to grips with this. And um, I don't think I'm going to go through them in detail, even though I've made the slides. So I'll just click through them. Um, but the basic idea is to try to sort of uh, mask out the space in between, either by bit masks or, in the other case, by um, splitting the tile and sort of shrink wrapping the near and far parts of it. However, um, they don't really have any generality in the sense that if you have several places where there's geometry or you have slopes, like I just showed you, they don't really help in this case. And they also make it necessary to have a preset pass because you need to work with the depth range um, to, for both of these. And they're kind of, you know, halfway fixes and why not just solve the problem, I've always argued. And that finally brings us to cluster shading. So, Ash, I'm not really sure about timing now since uh, I have no idea what I'm doing uh, with that and when we started and when I should stop. And still an hour. <laughs> I still have an hour. All right. Well, we'll see how we go. All right, so that maybe brings, a less. maybe a little bit less. All right, well, I'll start waving and I'll just go as fast as I can until I have to stop. <clears throat> All right, so cluster shading and um, yeah, I should have said that cluster shading covers then uh, 
both cluster deferred shading and f f forward hash. And uh, there's not much more to say. And um, <coughs> the key idea, unsurprisingly at this point, I think, I think I've built up sufficiently to this punchline, is that we're at the third dimension. If we have two dimension being a problem, we also subdivide in the depth direction. And <coughs> now comes a brief section where I defend the use of the word cluster. It's been it's been ridiculed, ridiculed, ridiculed on Twitter, so I feel I have to have to respond uh, forcefully. <clears throat> I actually, a couple of years ago, was ready to do the same, and thought this is a terrible term. We're not doing clustering at all. This is why. Why did I call it that? Oh God! But now I'm on the other side, saying no, it's a good term because the end result is that we have uh, clusters of samples that we want to treat together, not that we compute them by using clustering. In fact, we just use a grid. But that's probably the best clustering algorithm for, um, for the um, application, right? Because it's quick. But <coughs> we can go further. We don't have to just do a grid in 3D. We can uh, go higher dimensions, which we actually did in the original paper, uh, where we also tried out clustering on the normals, because you know, then you can discard lights that are not uh, front-facing. And that seemed like a good idea. It turned out to not provide any performance advantage that we could find. but. It could have other uses. I actually have one in mind. But you could do anything, like um, colors, whatever, shading properties, something like that. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> anyway, we'll stick to the 3D subdivisions now, because that's sort of the main proven useful thing. Um, <clears throat> and it looks a bit like this. So um, did I? No, I must have that on another slide. Anyway, you get this, um, since you slice in the depth direction, you now get the bounded volume around each group of samples, which means that your shading cost will be roughly proportional to your light density in the scene, rather than be view dependent as for tile shading. This is sort of the main, main property of clustered shading. So you don't have any nasty corner cases where you suddenly look through uh, a tree and uh, your shading cost jumps. It, this doesn't happen. Um, so, if we look again at the troublesome tiles, we had those really long ones, which is that problem. They'll end up with all the lights in the scene. If you're unlucky, right? You just look through a grid, you don't have any uh, depth culling at all anymore. Um, but the clusters, on the other hand, they um, approximate the visible geometry a lot better. And if we turn on the lights, we see um, that they affect only a group of clusters around the, uh, the actual light location. And that means that the length of the light lists will be proportional to the density of lights in the scene. So if there's two lights overlapping, you'll have a list length of two, which means that your shader will be a lot more coherent because they'll loop roughly the same amount if you design your scene well. But that's something you can control. Um, right, and that's how bad it can be. Don't do that. All right, <clears throat> in practice, um, the 2D part of the clustered shading is exactly like uh, tile shading. It's just a number of pixels. Uh, in the depth direction, it's a logarithmic function of uh, your view space distance. It is not just a logarithm, but it is a logarithmic function. Details are to be found in the paper. Um, and it's designed such that they are roughly self, uh, well, they are self-similar, so they are roughly cubical. And this falls out of, uh, and this gives you this kind of LOD behavior, so that in the far field you don't get the bazillion clusters, uh, because you know if they were world space sized, they become pixel sized on screen in the far distance, and they would only contain one light each, and it would be terrible. Um, <clears throat> so that's good, and um, if you combine it together with, uh, for example, noticed my favorite anecdote that the Unreal Engine seems to pop out lights and just kill them when they're small. Um, if you do something like that, some LOD on the lights, you end up with a sort of uniform. You only have the big lights in the far distance, but there you have the big clusters, so it works out. It's good. It took a lot of years to motivate that, but we did it anyway. It felt good at the time. Um, <clears throat> light assignment. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. You can do it in a number of ways. Uh, you could do it in using the extend the grid thing for tiled. Um, or whatever, but you work out the overlap of these boxes with the lights and store a list of uh, lights for each box. 
right? That's basically it. Um, yeah. Then I was going to talk a little bit about some trade-offs here because it turns out to be interesting. And the first one is whether you're going to do a sparse or a dense grid. In the paper we did a sparse grid and then you only store light lists for places you know are going to be used. So you start with the existing depth buffer and you can then um, later fill this only the cells that actually contain something. So therefore you need to have a depth pass. But you don't spend a lot of work uh, building lists that are never going to be used. Um, Uh, yeah, the dense grid, on the other hand, then you're building uh, the light lists without any knowledge of the information uh, of where uh, your actual visible geometry is in the scene. Um, so you have to assign lights to all of the cells up um, because you don't know. And, but the good thing is you can then kick this off as soon as you know where your camera is and where your light is. You don't have to wait for the depth buffer. So you can start it earlier in your rendering pass, which might make a difference. Um, but you'll build a lot larger, uh, a lot larger data structure. Uh, another good thing is if you have a dense uh, grid, you can access, for example, particles that would never be in a, a, a um, in a uh, depth buffer. You can uh, do participating media or whatever. So, um, and the performance is the same as you had of the shading. The shading performance is the same. It's only the light assignment that's different. So that's also good. <coughs> In a bit more detail, the sparse grid. So um, the number of non-empty cells will be correlated to your fractal dimension of your visible scene. And basically, I mean, you have, you're looking at the surface of the scene. So if you have a number of pixels, you'll have a number of clusters. It doesn't vary too much from that. If you have two, two layers, you get, you know, double, but it's not going to be all of them. It's just kind of, then you're looking at noise and noise isn't that much. It's not that interesting to render noise. And you usually don't have to worry about the shading if you're rendering noise anyway. It's, like, it's just noise. Um, but you can only access for those points you actually built the list. So you can't do participate in media or particles using this. Um, the good thing is that you can actually use this information because uh, you now have a coarse approximation of your visible geometry for other things. Interesting. Talk about that later. Dense grid um, pretty much covered this um, transparency. You can just do it. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, however, the number of cells in your grid could be a problem. And so we'll talk about that. So this is um, how my slide used to look. Um, but the just works part requires a little bit of uh, qualification, I feel now. Um, so you have this logarithmic depth distribution, right? Or um, slice distribution, which means that in this case, half of your depth range gets 7 out of 10 depth slices, which I before said was a good thing, which it is, and it isn't. And so we extend it to just look slightly more realistic with some more depth slices. Oops. And then we're up to 13 out of 17. And then I went and implemented this in the Unreal Engine. And they have like this infinite far plane thing going. And so I just picked 100,000 as, as far enough. And the near plane is at 7 of their units, whatever there is. Unreal centimeters, I don't know. And then you have 150 out of 160 slices in the, in, in, in the first half of the depth range. And it's sort of, that might not sound so bad because you don't know how far it is, but it turns out that you have a truckload of the slices in the first few meters from the camera. And that is a problem. Why? Well, because when we're adding lights to a dense grid, we're adding it everywhere. For a sparse grid, it's not necessarily a problem because you're not going to have anything on the near plane. You're not going to have, like, it's only going to be some stuff over there. And then those are the only voxels you're going to stick uh, lights into. So that's all right. But when you do it like this, you can imagine the bazillion extra little slices right next to the camera, and they're just all going to have this one light. So when you're inside the light, uh, and the light is a few meters, it's going to be in more than half of your grid cells. Um, it gets expensive. So moving over to st a stolen slide from uh, Emil Persson, of, uh, head of research at Avalanche, uh, who, we, who is uh, one of my co-presenters from SIGGRAPH. Um, they have this problem. They have a 50,000 meter depth range, 50 kilometer, 
so it goes pretty far away. And um, they have lights everywhere, right? They have the city lights. This is not so good, and they have these depth discontinuities going. So what they did is they did the things that game developers can do and people uh, writing graphics papers can't. And they said, yeah, well, you know, let's just uh, push out the near plane and make them oblong the first few, few meters. Uh, that looked good. I, I took five, he said, something like that. So that's great. And uh, then after 500 meters, they actually don't have lights. They just rent them as uh, point sprites in their engine. So that gave them a manageable depth range of about 16 slices, I think, to used. If that works for your case, this is not a bad idea. I'm not no, complaining at all from the point of view of the solution. I think it's a great solution to that particular problem. Um, <clears throat> stealing another slide from another co-presenter who did the part about mobile um, architectures and how we could adop adapt, adopt, adapt that one of those. Um, so yeah, for more details on that, you can download the slides uh, from the internet. And he invented this thing he calls cascaded clustering. And um, as you can see from the picture, he sets a threshold uh, of the size in world space of each cluster. And as you get closer to the camera, you start decreasing the X and Y resolution of your grid and increase the stride so that they don't go too small. And he does this in sort of chunks. That's the cascaded part. And then you don't have a uh, truckload of uh, clusters right next to the camera. And I think this solution is probably, uh, with a few minor modifications, likely to be a good sort of general purpose solution that will just fix this problem and work for every, uh, every possible scenario. So <clears throat> to give you a bit of the intuition, I mean, wh what we're trying to do with light assignment is work out uh, as short as possible light lists for every pixel but no shorter, because then we'll be wasting time building lists. And uh, that means that you want to have some kind of rough size uh, equality between the size of your clusters and the size of your light sources. So you want to have them smaller, but not too much smaller than your average light source, something like that. That's sort of the intuition. Um, <clears throat> the next trade-off I wanted to mention briefly is deferred versus forward shading. I've already mentioned that it's easy to switch, so it's not a fundamental decision you have to make when you go with tiled or clustered shading, even more so with clustered. Um, obviously, if you do deferred, it's easier to support the sparse grid. But if you do a forward, you can have MSAA or, and support transparency and different uh, shading models on your surfaces, which is harder with deferred. But as I said, it's not a fundamental decision. You can do what, uh, for example, Avalanche do and use um, deferred for the bulk of the geometry and forward for, example, transparent stuff and telephone wires. And you get the same shading on everything and it looks nice. So that's, but um, the other two examples I had, uh, games, the Forza Horizon 2 or something, 3, 2 or 3, and um, the Outlast, they actually do straightforward renders with a preset pass. So, that appears to be particularly popular on the Xbox One. Um, I think they both said that somehow. Right. Um, <clears throat> falling out of this is the supporting transparent geometry. And I just wanted to contrast tiled forward shading, which I presented in a talk um, at SIGGRAPH in 2012, with clustered. And so, Basically, to support transparent geometry, since you don't know where it is, because it's not in your um, depth buffer from your preset pass, it's not in your um, yeah, G buffer, um, you, have to, you could find the nearest boundary by doing a separate geometry pass. But basically, you're going to extend your tile depth range to, to cover any transparent geometry, which means if you were looking through a window, it's going to go right up to the near plane. Uh, and that's the problem, because then your light assignment is back to 2D, and um, that is a really bad idea if you have lots of lights. And the whole point of this talk is that we have lots of lights. Um, <clears throat> for clustered forward shading, it just works. So here that term yeah, is where in its original uh, place, uh, assuming you're happy with your footnote. <clears throat> 
Um, and you can make it work for the sparse uh, cluster grid as well if you do a pre-geometry pass and flag the, the cells that are, 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 are um, contains geometry. So that's pretty nice and you don't get any worse efficiency because you have already di divided them up in the depth range. And that was all I was going to say and I've already said that several times I think. So that was the first part. Yeah, on some kind of time. Uh, any sort of roundup questions? We can go back and look at the slides if you wanted, had thought about something by now. Um, that's not a problem at all. Or we can do it again later because if you're like me, it usually comes later, the questions. Um, <clears throat> so before the um, shadowy part, are we having a break or should I just uh, take a deep breath and We'll probably run out of time. Yeah, this one is probably a bit long, really. It, the problem when you have long talks like this is you don't have time to rehearse them because it takes hours, and yeah, hours you don't have too many hours in the day, basically. They seem to be getting shorter. Children might have something to do with it. Anyway, um, moving right along, we'll do the same as last time, define the problem, because shadows with many lights, it could mean anything. There are so many uh, possible problem spaces out there. So we'll just get started. <coughs> um, what I said. And so our problem here is um, in between the previous slide, which I've deleted. So um, basically, it's not millions of lights, it's not one or two lights, but hundreds, maybe thousands of lights. And this has some implications. If you have millions of lights, you can do approximate shadows. For example, you might have heard of imperfect shadow maps, where they do exactly that. But since you have maybe 100 lights affecting every pixel, the problems average out, as they like to say, sometimes. Um, for our case, we might have 10 uh, lights per sample. You will see the shadows. Each shadow will have a distinct boundary, so we, we need to have good quality. Um, and then we want to have it run in real time and no pre-computation, thank you very much and all that. And <clears throat> this is what we get. So I'll just pause it quickly to let you almost see. Um, hmm. Could have been better. Anyway, um, you can see vaguely the light boundaries. So there are some really big lights and a lot of smaller lights in this scene. And so there's about 400 when everything is at started up. 2.6 million triangles and it renders at uh, a minimum of 30 frames per second on a Titan. And since we have a generation or two of graphics card out since then, it should, should run faster now. Haven't tried it. Oh, and then it didn't start playing again. So we just run the film. <clears throat> and so yeah, the average uh, light density, so the average number of lights per pixel here is 20 when you get into the, the peak of it. There's quite a lot of lights, and uh, we stop with a view of a beautifully modeled and animated cannon by some unknown skilled artist or programmer. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> the first part actually is about the fully dynamic case. Then uh, people will realize that a lot of stuff is static, so why don't we make use of this information to make it faster? And so we did that too. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, so we'll use shadow maps. I don't think we need to talk about that. Everyone knows you have to use shadow maps if you want it to be real time. And this is the problem you get when you want to do many lights and shadow maps. So you first you need to work out which of the lights actually cast shadows. Then you need to allocate them a shadow map of some resolution to make it look nice. We wanted quality, memory for that. Find the geometry that needs to be rendered into said shadow map do that and then you need to draw the scene with shading using the shadow maps. It pretty much summarizes the problem. And um, the solution that I'll be talking about is based on what I presented in a paper from i3D and then we extended it basically with uh, optimizations for the study case in a paper the year after, which is sort of a, a superset of the i3D paper. So if you're going to look it up, look at that one. Um, and the sort of 
properties were shown in the film earlier. So starting with the first problem, we'll go through them one at a time. Um, this basically falls out of the fact that we're building this on clustered shading. And we're building it on the sparse um, method. So we want the uh, clusters um, flagged that contain geometry and nothing else, because this becomes very useful later. Um, and I want to highlight here that we um, make heavy use for this um, but uh, we make use of this um, link between each cluster and light. So we store a flat list of um, cluster light pairs, which is basically just integers saying that this cluster is affected by this light, which makes, lets you do mappings between them. All right, that was that. That was easy. The next part is more interesting. We need to work out a good resolution for each shadow map in a way that doesn't take forever. Here's a fast one. Uh, you can just pick a constant resolution. I will have 256 for all my shadow maps. But then we're not really talking about uh, high quality anymore, so we didn't think about that for too long. Um, the sort of do thing to do is to match, the best thing you can do with shadow maps basically is to match the density of your um, shadow map samples to the density of your pixels in screen space so that they are one to one, so one per each. Uh, in practice, it's impossible, but you want to try, right? unless you pick some uh, much cooler um, shadowing technique. <clears throat> so uh, looking at this, here's the road again, now only with two lights and uh, TARDIS added for extra effect. Uh, can't have too many TARDISes in your scenes, if you ask me. I don't know if you noticed the TARDISes flying around in the intro film. No, maybe not. <clears throat> but they have lights on them, so they're animated and everything again by some unknown but skilled artist. Screen space uh, bounding box. So this is one common approach. You just take the screen space bounding box of your light that gives you a footprint in number of pixels. You pick your shadow map to be a proportional number of pixels or texels and the match is pretty good. Except when you're standing inside the light, like this nearer one, uh, in which case you have no idea what the bounding box of the light is in screen space, or even if you do, um, it's going to be huge because you're basically working out what resolution you would have needed on the near plane, which is typically something you never need. So it's a massive overestimation. Uh, so it just doesn't work. Not cool. Um, <clears throat> another approach that I've seen out there is that you project uh, the bounding box of each object in your scene onto the light and work out from there. It works if you have small bounding boxes and they don't sort of end up on top of your lights and you don't have big, long, flat things like roads that aren't chunked up. Um, so we don't want to do that either. Um, project individual samples. Now it's starting to get good quality because basically what you do is you do all your shadow map looks, lookups once. Then um, that tells you the derivative in shadow map space and you then go and allocate your shadow map to that resolution. And this has been done, it's called resolution match shadow maps, and it's pretty clever. Um, but then it gets very expensive because we're going to do this for lots of pixels and lots of lights. So now <clears throat> we had some kind of approximation of the visible pixels, which is the clusters. So we want to make the most of them. Um, so they look a bit like this in screen space, and then um, each of them have a fixed screen space footprint because we base them on a 2D grid. So we know they are 64 by 64 pixels, for example. This is a parameter. Um, if we then look at this from the side, uh, <coughs> still has a 64 by 64 um, footprint in that camera view that we looked at before. And the projection on the shadow map then should also have a 64 by 64 texel footprint and we have matched the resolutions, pretty simple. And this is proportional to the solid angle subtended by the uh, binding box of the clusters. So that's what we do, basically. And all of the details are in the paper, of course. And then if we look back, we see the distant light. And <clears throat> there, the cl a cluster over there is sort of subtends a, a bigger solid angle and therefore a smaller uh, resolution. So that's how it works out. And then you do this in parallel for all cluster light pairs and just use atomic operations to reduce the final uh, number for each shadow map and you have your resolution. Details, details, details. 
Then we need to allocate memory for these shadow maps. And we have some kind of, uh, we're coming back to this problem of um, needing to store all shadow maps. So because the modern shading techniques, you're random accessing your light in the inner loop of the shader, all shadow maps have to exist before you do the shading pass. With traditional deferred shading, since you do one light at a time, you could reuse the shadow map space and make this nice pipeline, but we can't do that. So we need to store um, the, the shadow map samples efficiently. And ideal, the ideal is, of course, to only store exactly the samples we will use, which is somewhat unrealistic unless we go to exotic methods that aren't really real time. Uh, <clears throat> but looking again at what we have with our clusters, we can see um, that they project to this region of the shadow map and that this region is A, unused, and B, it's not square. And happily, uh, modern GPUs have support for uh, virtual textures in hardware. And that works just like virtual memory on any computer, except it's uh, instead of linear blocks of memory, it's in square tiles of uh, texture uh, coordinate space or texture space, whatever you like. Um, so the physical memory is committed in tiles or pages of say 256 by 256 uh, texels. And it's available on all modern uh, graphics APIs. <clears throat> and this, this fits our ideal pretty well. So we only need to commit um, physical backing where we're actually going to store samples. And since they tend to cluster together because of screen space coherency and so on, it works out pretty well. Um, now, of course, we have to project bounding boxes of clusters onto um, shadow map pages, which isn't trivial. Um, but what we came up with is that we um, align the shadow map in world space, and we also align the um, clusters. We take the world space bounding box of the cluster, and then this actually becomes quite a short uh, snippet of code to get the bounding region. And then we do this in parallel for every cluster light pair and uh, build up this uh, bit mask for each cube map face of the shadow map. And believe it or not, this is not actually a, an expensive part of, of this uh, algorithm. Um, <clears throat> this could be because um, with um, we used OpenGL for the implementation and um, there you have to copy the bit masks back to the host to do the physical um, memory management, it's, you have to do it through a host API, which is a terrible um, sort of pipelining problem. Hopefully it will get solved down the line. I'm not sure what to do in Vulkan or whatever. But I've tried to, tried to make this case at every opportunity to representatives. <clears throat> All right, some quick results. Um, if we do standard shadow maps with this view in the animation I s showed you before, which is the peak, uh, we would need some uh, 4 billion texels. And with virtual, uh, we only get 161 million. And if you take that in 16-bit shadow maps, um, you can see that it's something totally outrageous to something we might consider on a modern uh, graphics card or console. <clears throat> we can also uh, quite easily, because we have uh, computed the um, correct, so to speak, shadow map resolution by matching the screen space density. We can quite easily just step down quality across the board instead of having this situation where you sort of uh, one shadow map keeps popping, this one got higher res, this one got low res. We gotta pick and choose. We can just reduce quality to keep a memory target or um, something like that. Could even do it dynamically. And to give you some idea that it might work, um, I have a couple of examples here. So the memory stepped down from 300 megabytes-ish to 80 through undersampling two or four times. And if we zoom in, you can see, maybe, you can see. Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to show you that here you have the edge aliasing, which is one pixel per pixel, and the shadow is a lot blockier maybe about four times blockier. That's the sort of, and if you apply your standard filtering uh, PCF to this and whatnot, you might be quite happy with four times less for a lot less memory use. And yeah, this is a knob that you can just dial up and down in this uh, algorithm, which is nice. All right, that was a lot of uh, talk about memory. 
is one of the cool things, I guess. Then we're going to do culling. Um, <coughs> because we're going to draw something into the shadow maps. And so culling, it's just like view first and culling in that we're trying to cull chunks of geometry against some kind of uh, viewing volumes. And we represent geometry by bounding boxes, chunks of triangles by bounding boxes. It is not so much like view frustum culling in that we're going to do hundreds of these rather than just one view frustum, which, which is um, the typical thing. And we're also going to have very short viewing volumes. Um, typically, I mean, you have one viewing volume, it's 50 kilometers long. Uh, culling is one type of problem. We're going to have hundreds of small ones. Uh, so it's quite different um, <clears throat> because the lights have uh, as short range as you can get away with. And since we're doing omnidirectional lights, we're also going to have six viewing thruster pointing in one for each cube face sitting together and they share planes. And that gives you a nice opportunity for culling them all together. I'll just skip that. Too much details. Get to the more interesting part. So, <clears throat> lots of lights, they're small. Um, the difference is there, all right? We need, um, we need to have higher granularity when we're doing the culling because Again, intuition, if we want to effectively cull geometry on a light, which is this large, if the geometry is this big, it's going to just always probably render into all six cube faces, and we're not going to get any culling done. So we need to have smaller chunks of geometry when we have smaller viewing volumes. This sort of is intuit intuit intuitively makes sense. And so here is sort of rendering hash up of how this might work out. This one overlaps all three. Uh, but if we instead chunked it up in smaller chunks, I'm sure we get a lot more culling work because we have more boxes to test, but we only have to render one third of the number of triangles. Um, and triangle drawing turns out it's one of the biggest bottlenecks in this uh, type of algorithm. So it, this is really quite important to be able to tune that. Um, so what we do uh, is we do have this concept of a batch of triangles, which is nothing new. What is new is that it's quite small. So um, in our implementations and published figures, it's somewhere averaging around 100 triangles per batch, and then a bounding box together with that, um, and a few more bits of metadata. And it's constructed offline. So we have a path where we go and round up triangles that belong together, so they're animated by the same matrices and whatever else you need to take into account. Since we're doing shadows, we don't need to bother about material, um, so that's nice. Uh, but then at runtime, they are updated, so the binding box is recalculated every frame. <coughs> um, right, that's what I was going to say next. And then we build the binding vo volume hierarchy out of the batches and traverse it for each light. So we have a few hundred lights traversing this uh, binding volume hierarchy in parallel. Um, and we used a 32, um, a branching factor of 32 in this tree because it gets you a nice and shallow tree and it turned out to work well. Um, I'm sure other branching factors would work too, but basically I could reuse code, so this was a good idea. Um, and this gives you a list of uh, lights for each, um, sorry, a list of uh, triangle batches for each light, and then we just need to draw that. Um, <coughs> Then we want to do better than just um, culling each cube face, because um, remember we have this large region that's unused, and we haven't even committed any physical memory for this region, and so it's going to be pretty stupid to draw geometry there because it's just going to be uh, discarded. And that's, by the way, the specification for virtual uh, shadow maps, uh, virtual textures. If you use them as render targets and draw into an uncommitted area, it's just discarded. It doesn't page fault or anything. But it's a bit stupid, so let's not do that. We can save a lot of time. Um, so um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to tell you with this picture, but oh yes, now I remember. Let's take the next one. <coughs> the yellow area is the projection of uh, the batches, bounding boxes, onto the shadow map. And here we can reuse our projection machinery that we used to find uh, the physical pages earlier, so that's neat. And then we do just an overlap test between these two masks. So if the projected uh, batches overlap the projection of the 
clusters, then we need to draw it, otherwise we don't. And so, for example, if we zoom in on this part of the road over here, so keep that view in mind when we go back. So those are the clusters. See that the projection of the clusters over on the side there does not overlap the projection of the shadow caster, and hence it does not have to be drawn. And that's pretty much all there is to it, except for actually getting this implemented. And good luck. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fiddly. So yeah, if we look away, then you see the right-hand side, there's no clusters projecting there, therefore it's discarded. When it's blue, we can do that again. When it's yellow, there is an overlap and it's being drawn. So see now everything's being drawn. Now the right-hand side, it turns blue when there's no overlap. And so we're not drawing those shadow casters, even though they actually affect, I mean, if you do just the view first in culling, they clearly are in the view of the, of the cube face. So, um, <clears throat> so you do that calculation in a separate pass after the culling, and then you just filter out um, um, batches of geometry that doesn't need to get rendered. And then you need to draw this stuff into the shadow maps. Um, since we do all the culling on the GPU by um, building and traversing these binding hierarchies, um, we do build a command list on the GPU as well. So then we can actually do just one single draw call for all the shadow casting geometry. We did a draw call per light, but you can actually set it up to do a single draw call for everything with no synchronization with the CPU. So that's not a problem uh, as long as you package everything neatly uh, on the GPU. And to look at what this gains us, um, if we're doing the naive thing, which is just to inflate the replicate the geometry into all six cube faces. Um, for this view, you'd get something like what it says up there. Um, culling each cube face individually gets you down to 20 million. And <clears throat> doing then the projection map, as I call this, uh, more better culling uh, gets you down to 13 million triangles for the worst case in this scene. And again, this is the difference between something that's clearly outrageous for real-time purposes and something that we could perhaps consider there's also a lot of um, performance on the table, I observed when I did this. So there is a sort of optimiza uh, optimization challenge in there somewhere that, you know, a factor of five, that's a big difference. But then theoretical numbers, probably not reachable in practice. And finally, you've got to shade the scene. And that's easy. Basically, um, you just need to somehow access your shadow maps. And um, <clears throat> so another strong reason to read the 2015 version of this paper is that when I wrote the 2014 version, I didn't realize that you can't do um, a random access of bindless textures where you can do lookup of a texture from, an, from, from a handle on the GPU. You're not allowed to do that uh, in such a way that so it's a samples from the same triangle look up different. It's not actually allowed. Uh, it works on NVIDIA hardware, but there is a terrible performance impact. So you don't want to do that. So for the 2015 version, we instead went with a, just a big virtual array texture, which just has as many layers as you're allowed to, and the top resolution. And then we just do manually the cube, cube map uh, coordinate lookup. And this is faster, much faster. So I um, want to do that anyway. But once you have this uh, array texture, you just get your light index. You look, this is the same as your shadow map index. You look up your shadow map and you sample uh, the right cube face. That's not the difficult part. So uh, that's it. We're done. Um, how am I doing for time? Should I keep going? Still time questions? Because we're not done. We're, not done. <laughs> we're done with that part, and that's sort of the the. Um, the dynamic part, but then, yeah, as I hinted, like, you know, you look at this scene, we, and in the initial film, uh, we're treating everything as if it were dynamic. So we're updating everything, uh, recomputing every shadow map. Um, obviously, most of it is static, so it's a bad idea. Most of the lights are still, most of the geometry is not moving. Um, so we should be able to do better. <clears throat> um, so for static lights and shadow casters, we can pre-compute everything, for example. 
um, so pre-computed shadow maps or voxelized shadows, as some colleagues of mine uh, presented. Uh, we can also do what um, I can't remember. Valiant is that? Oh, it's one of the uh, talks from, and now they each have a light on top. So, um, yeah, that's the end for real this time. Hey, do you ever um, actually start kind of like doing like non-real-time stuff and then try and make it work in real time? Or is it the other way around, you're always starting focusing on real-time graphics? Yeah, um, so uh, my implementations always start out very much not in real time because it's not. Uh, you want to find out if your concept is viable first before you go and spend a lot of time even porting it to a GPU. So, yeah, when I started, the first implementation of clustered shading was seconds per frame rather than anything else, and similar for this stuff. Uh, but the design is always with the real time in mind. Because otherwise, you have totally different trade offs. Um, I mean, if you're doing offline rendering, which is, is its own separate, half separate discipline, you're looking at image quality as the primary goal. With real time, it's got to be real time first, and then quality is secondary. So they are quite different in that sense. So you must know when you start which one you're designing for. Yeah. You said you were using about 100 polygons per batch. Yep. Um, is there a specific way you're calculating that for each batch, or is it just flat up, we'll use this many for each batch? I try to range from you know, 32 to 1024 and run benchmarks on it. And so I designed the batch producing offline tool to be able to so do that. Is it dynamic on each uh, batch, or are you using a fixed amount? On each one. No, a fixed amount across the okay. scene, and then it just subdivides everything down to that level, and uh, as long as it, uh, it's allowed, like they're animated by the same uh, matrix, for example, that might split them further, or and then it's not, it's it's sort of a greedy top-down uh, thing, or actually no, it's a greedy bottom-up, <laughs> so it doesn't end up being exactly the number of triangles you want, but. Um, in that ballpark. So I think the goal, when I say 100, the, 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 the maximum size was 128. So then you got average about 100 in actual fact. But um, if you want the sort of performance hunch, they're going a lot smaller. Um, hertz performance, because you get more batches, which means more hierarchy traversal. If you go larger, you end up with more polygons that you've got to test because there are larger batches of polygons. You end up with more part, uh, triangles you have to draw because they'll end up in more of the cube faces. So yeah, yeah and I mean they extend in space, and this is what you try to avoid. So, but I mean in a span around you know 64 to maybe 100, uh, 256 for those scenes we tested, there wasn't much difference really. Okay. And we tested a number of scenes, so this is reported in the paper. So it's not just for the one scene. Um, Sure. When you're doing this kind of visualization of like what's actually happening with your rendering, do you actually try and draw it in an efficient way? Because you have to be reading into the same data that you're trying to draw with. So is that really inefficient to do? Uh, so typically, I would do that in a totally different implementation, okay. which yeah. is uh, not focused so on efficiency. More focused on just giving you easy access to this data. And yeah. Visualization. So I. I was working on a demo, which I've promised people at Sigraf, and I still haven't uh, delivered on. Um, and in that, I actually spent a little bit of time optimizing the visualization because it's so horribly slow when you have <laughs> thousands and of boxes on screen. So. Yeah. But yeah, typically, no, it's no uh, point. Are there any other like lessons you've learned in terms of like visualizing these sort of things? Yeah, well, I've learned a lesson that the debug visualizations often look much cooler than the final results. So it's, uh, <laughs> That's what we want to show people. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Anything else? You are very free to ask generic questions about this sort of thing if you, know, you don't have to be too focused as long as Ashley doesn't say that we're out of time. <laughs> we can have a chat. I showed up late, so I missed out on some of the earlier stuff. But I had a look at the paper in advance. Okay. And you mentioned that you found clustering was too slow, even with k-means. Yes. Um, have you tried taking 
the approximations you're using of clustering and then running one iteration of k-means? No, but I mean, I think there are, <clears throat> It's interesting. We've we've talked about it many times because you you end up like you're looking, you're lining up a corner with your camera, so it contains one strip of pixels, which is silly to assign lines sep separately. You want to merge that with a neighboring cluster and have a, but then you run into problems like so now they not don't have the same pixel footprint. So for the shadowing calculations, that's kind of inconvenient. Um, <clears throat> And to be honest, it probably won't help because they'll just work out the same lists and when you're shading it, it's going to be the same performance. Um, yeah, yeah uh, the hunch is that, yeah, you could do that. It would tidy it up a bit. It wouldn't help. The cost of doing that would eat up any savings on the other Have end. Have you tried it in non-real time to see if that would actually change anything or is it just you're pretty sure it won't? And Move on. Yeah, no, we haven't. We haven't tried it. I mean, it's a sort of too too uh, low interest okay. in question, really, since the the hunch is very much against it. So we're still working on convincing everyone to use cluster shading first, and then we'll talk about the details. But um, yeah, no, there's a lot of interesting details that are unexplored still. Yeah. A lot of these things have um, a lot of empty space in them. Yep. What's the sort of pathologically bad case, like maybe looking through a forest of trees full of uh, fireflies? Well, um, for, for the shadowing algorithm, that would be a problem. Because, um, well, basically your virtual shadow maps won't gain you anything because they will all be committed because something will project into every part of every shadow map. Um, for just clustered shading is not a pathological case in the sense that you have, if you do the dense clustering, you have already computed the lighting information everywhere in your viewing volume, and so it just works. Um, for tile shading, this is, would be a huge problem. You, couldn't, you, don't want to, you don't want to do that. But for clustered shading, not so much. Um, of course, I mean, since the clusters get bigger, the further away, if you are having a forest with you know, a uniform density of fireflies, uh, you'll get more and more in the clusters as you go further away. So that would require some kind of LOD on your light. But that's not our fault, if you know what I mean, right? <laughs> so like what they do, seem to do, I haven't really looked into details, but once they get to pixel size light, you don't draw them anymore. Or you switch to point sprites, which is actually probably the best idea anyway. So this is sort of an, a thing, an, another of those details I've never got around to actually implementing, but, and I think I throw it out there in the paper. But once you, if you're doing tiled or clustered shading, once your light uh, screen space footprint is smaller than some proportion of the cluster uh, footprint or tile, you should probably just use normal deferred shading or splat it in some other way because the overhead will be greater. So. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, Anyone else wants to chat to Willow? Thanks. Thanks.